Fit Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. The Profile is the show where we delve into a person's life, faith and ministry. And it's brought to you in association with the UK's leading Christian magazine. That's Premier Christianity. It's the magazine I have the great privilege of editing. And I would love you to have a free copy. Why not go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample, type your details in and we will happily send you a free copy print copy of the very latest edition features plenty of interviews like this one reviews features columnists news and more but today here on premier christian radio you've joined us for the profile and i'm delighted to say i'm speaking to the newly appointed principal of moreland's theological college the reverend dr david hillborn David is also chair of the Evangelical Alliance's Theology Advisory Group and was previously principal of St. John's College, Nottingham. He's married to Mia, who is a hospital chaplain, and the couple have two children. David, welcome to the show. Sam, great to be here. Tell me something then of your early life growing up. That's always where we like to start on the show. Uh, Tell me a bit about your parents. What was life like growing up? Well, certainly it wasn't a church going home. We went to baptisms, weddings and funerals. And we had a big extended family in South London. I was brought up in Forest Hill, SE23. Oh, yeah. um, so I'm a South London boy <laughs> and I can still turn on the accent when you want Brilliant. me to. Can we do the rest of this interview? In the uh, accent, we please? could do, but <laughs> some of your listeners might struggle to understand it. Um, yeah, so I uh, grew up there and uh, minimal Kind of nominal Christianity. Yeah. And that continued when we moved to the leafy suburbs of West Wickham in Kent, when my dad did well in his career. But at the age of 11, I went through a bit of a trauma in that my parents had a very messy divorce. And uh, I guess that set me to thinking a bit about life, the universe and everything. I was quite an earnest kid, sort of a bit studious and um, had by that point started going to Cub Scouts at my local church, which was congregational and then became URC. And uh, there was a rule in those days, and this was sort of early to mid 70s, that if you went to Cubs, you had to go to Sunday school. And I went through gritted teeth the first few times. But actually, much to my surprise, I enjoyed it. There were some really committed youth and children's work people at that church and I still remember the names of them particularly a guy called Frank Pitt who led the junior church as it was called who was passionate um, somewhat bohemian he was a photographer he was different he wasn't my stereotype of the Sunday school teacher creative and imaginative and uh, welcoming I still remember The uh, first Sunday I went and I travelled there on my bike, it's an indication of how indifferent my parents were to church. They just set me on my way at the age of seven um, uh, initially. um, And then that became more serious following the divorce uh, when I was 11. But that first time I remember as I cycled up to the church, he was standing at the side entrance where the junior church met, basically welcoming people. And that's a metaphor of what the church should be. It should be a place of hospitality and welcome uh, with open arms to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he embodied that. So I went fitfully um, for the first few years uh, from sort of primary school through to secondary school. And then I guess um, partly because I started studying English literature and really enjoyed it and started thinking about ideas, Around 14, 15, and the transition to youth ministry at my church, I began to ask some really serious questions about who this Jesus was and who God was and what the Christian faith was. And there was a small group of adults leading the youth work there who impressed me with their own life um, and really began to take me beyond the church. To be honest with you, Sam, the church was quite liberal as a whole. And um, they took me to more evangelistic meetings, uh, mission meetings. And I began to to hear the gospel really powerfully preached and shared. And one of those places they took me to was Hildenborough Hall, where a guy called Tom Rees, a major post-war evangelist, has set up a ministry. And his son, Justin, had been taking that forward. And that combined with having a team from Operation Mobilization come to our church for a week were the catalysts that right. uh, kind of led me to make a commitment to yeah. Christ, a clear, unequivocal yes to Jesus. And really, I remember going home and uh, getting pretty much the only Bible in our house 
and and reading it and starting at Genesis, you know, the classic, yeah. <laughs> uh, plowing through the first five, six books of the Old Testament, you didn't struggling get stuck a bit in, stuck in, in Leviticus. Leviticus. Yeah, <laughs> struggling in Leviticus. And then a kind soul said, maybe you want to skip, go to Matthew, read the New Testament and then go back. And uh, thank you, Lord, for that person, because uh, without that, I might have been lost a bit. But yeah, um, yeah so, so that was uh, your teenage really, years. that was teenage years. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned um, your dad did, did well in his career. What, what yeah. was his career? Um, he was an accountant to start with. Right. Um, uh, he left school at 16, but he did go to grammar school. But in those days, it would have taken a big commitment financially for his parents to put him through university. Oh. So he uh, went and worked for a bank, but did his exams at night school to become an accountant. And he ended up as finance director of Pirelli General, that multinational company wow. that makes tyres. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, we all know through Formula One and all yeah. the rest of it. So he had yeah, an international yeah. uh, a career in, in uh, directing yeah. uh, the work there. Was the the divorce, would, would you describe that as traumatic? I mean, a young age yeah. to, to witness your parents do that. What kind of effect do you think that had on you both then and I guess later in life? Well, it was traumatic in the sense that um, they were rowing. They were having really quite sort of awful uh, arguments. And I would sit at the top of the stairs. You see so many films with kids doing this. It's almost like a cliche these days. Right. But yeah. of course, that was the only reality I knew. Yeah. The only family I knew was that family. And I didn't quite know what was going on. And um, that went on for about three years, really. Um, and eventually, uh, the whole thing came to a head, as I say, when I was 11. And uh, really, the driver was the fact my dad had an affair. He had an affair with somebody he was working with and uh, left home and left us to live with her. And I found that really, really difficult mm. to cope with mm. and wouldn't speak to her, basically, for a number of years. Um, following my conversion at the age of 15, though, things began to thaw because, of course, you read scripture, you fall in love with Jesus. You yeah. understand you can't follow Jesus without a heart of forgiveness yeah. and reconciliation. And that actually feeds into a lot of what happened in later ministry for me. Oh. But we'll come to that. But um, here's the thing. Um, my parents are now passed away, but my one living sort of uh, person of that level of the family tree in my close family is my stepmother, the person my dad married, his second wife. Mm. And the extraordinary thing is that um, later in life, she began to go to church, went to an Alpha course. And uh, God's now called me, as you said, to Moreland's College to be yeah. the principal there. I'm about 15 minutes away from her. Oh. She lives in the New Forest, uh, where my dad moved 35 years ago to head up the... Um, Pirelli operation in Southampton and uh, you know God's got this amazing way of um, kind of uh, surprising you and confounding all your sort of images of people mm. and my relationship with with her her name is Trisha is is, is close now yeah and wow. uh, you know she came to my installation at Moreland's oh, and wow. had smiles all over her face mm -hmm. so that's a, great, that's a great story. Um, yeah. So we got to your teenage years, yeah. making a much more serious commitment, I guess, to God and to your faith. Yeah. What came next? Well, really university, Sam, to be honest. Um, as I say, I was quite uh, into reading, uh, particularly English literature, and went to Nottingham University to read that. And they had a very vibrant Christian union and some really great churches, actually, in Nottingham. Um, yeah, three years, three great years at Nottingham University, meeting some really uh, kind of committed on fire for God Christians um, and the Christian Union was a massive part of moving me on in my faith and uh, at the end of my second year I went on mission with Arab World Ministries to North Africa to test whether a calling which I thought was a calling to Christian leadership was overseas or back in the UK. Um, it was a great experience with AWM but uh, praying and reflecting on it it became clear that my calling was to ordain ministry um, in the United Reformed Church in the UK. So um, they let me go straight from Nottingham uh, to Oxford to study theology, um, train for the ministry, because I'd from the age of 16, I'd pretty much every vacation from school work for Southwark Borough Council in their youth service, in their youth centres, secular youth centres. And um, that gave me a bit of street cred, I think, <laughs> in the eyes of the URC. Um, it certainly was a really hard school of knocks. I mean, it was not easy to marshal those those 
children uh, in some of the roughest areas of the country in Southwark. Um, but it was really good uh, grounding yeah. in working with people of all classes and all backgrounds. Yeah. Um, so I went to Oxford, studied theology, absolutely adored it, loved it. Um, people like Tom Wright were teaching Alistair oh, wow. McGrath at that time right, at yeah. Oxford. Um, so it was a very, very rich experience. I mean, people who <laughs> were uh, not as evangelical as those guys. But um, well, it's, in, it's interesting because sometimes you talk to people who study theology as a Christian yeah. in a secular or mainstream yeah. institution, yeah. let's say, not a Bible college like Morelands, yeah. yeah. where there there can be teachers who, like you say, they aren't a Tom Wright or an Alison yeah. McGrath. They might may actually be teachers in theology that don't believe in God at yeah, all. Sure, sure. And some Christians find that find that really um, really tough. But I guess yeah. you were blessed with lecturers who kind of shared your faith was was that helpful um certainly was yeah um i just want to doff my cap particularly to michael green recently passed away and with the lord uh, praise god um he was at the time the rector of st aldate's church in oxford but he also runs something called the theological students fellowship which was, which was a kind of christian union for theologians right and um that was a kind of compliment to uh, the lectures that i was getting yeah. both from more evangelical lecturers and from sometimes agnostic or atheistic yes, lecturers. Yeah. And it was a really sanitary kind of uh, grouping of folk who would gather together and, you know, affirm the right. resurrection of Christ when perhaps in a lecture it had been questioned yeah. as a bodily event. It's interesting because I have heard some people who perhaps are in, in a similar position to you now heading up a, a, a theological college that has a Christian underpinning. Yeah. They sometimes make the argument, come to us, don't go to Oxford, yeah. don't go to the... Yeah mainstream universities because we actually believe this stuff but it's interesting of course hearing that story from yourself you went through that without yeah. any ma major crisis of faith it sounds like so well there can I'm be not, a... i wouldn't quite put it like oh, okay. that so um uh, my view for what it's worth is that um god will call people to different contexts so right. in my case um i'm pretty much glad that i had that challenge um i was ready intellectually i think f to enter that fray but it wasn't always easy, Sam. And um, of course, you have to bear in mind that as a graduate, I was training for ministry. So I did have in my theological college what we call formational uh, context in which to train. I had to go to morning prayer every right. day. We yeah. had communion once a week. Um, we did a lot of stuff that wasn't on the uh, Oxford University degree okay. curriculum that I yeah. was following. Um, and sometimes the spiritual formation sat oddly with some of the intellectual stuff I was doing in the university. Mm. But thanks to we did have some outstanding people who could make that connection between the, uh, you know, really quite challenging academic learning yes. that I was doing in the university and, you know, the training I was doing as a URC mm. or ordinand. Um, yes. But um, in the middle of my second year, I have to be honest, um, I can really remember it. I was uh, studying Jeremiah. And uh, in Jeremiah, there are basically two types of literature. There's the historical material and then the oracular material, the prophetic, mm -hmm. more poetic material. And the uh, essay that I had to write was basically how do these two genres of biblical material line up? Mm -hmm. And um, it just occurred to me, I was sat in the theological library in Oxford, that I had read at that point three or four scholarly books on Jeremiah but because of the rush and the intensity of the study, and anybody who's uh, done theology in a context like that will know what it's like, um, uh, I had really not sat back and read through the whole of Jeremiah for that essay. I'd read Jeremiah before, but I hadn't sat back and just let God speak to me through Jeremiah. And I thought, this is getting the you know cart before the horse. And I had a bit of a crisis. I took a week out, I remember that, went back to Nottingham where I'd been formed so much spiritually and some very wise people took me to one side I prayed and uh, God said go back but go back with a different spirit hmm. and I did and uh, that was a, an important moment yeah. because yeah. I, I began to understand that theology is only worth its salt if it's serving the mission of God if it's serving the church of Jesus Christ I knew that but um, I had to kind of instill that in my core being really yeah. and and that was a, a, a key moment for me but um, I think that you can do effective and fruitful training mm -hmm. for mission and ministry in either context. Yeah. So after uh, studying was it then straight into becoming a URC minister? It really was yeah um, except that in their wisdom the URC did have this thing called an internship year at the end of the uh, third year 
So I graduated. Um, I met my wife at that point. We got married at the end of our third year, Mia. Uh, she was training also for leadership um, in the URC. And we went off to Birmingham and I had a really, really great year, actually, um, working with a, a very wise minister now with the Lord called Murdoch McKenzie, who'd been on mission in India, uh, knew the great theologian Leslie Newbegin really well. And through Murdoch, I got introduced to Leslie Newbegin, who'd come back from India and started working uh, with such humility in a place called Winston Green in Birmingham, just doing ordinary mission right, and ministry yeah. in a small church there. Um, so that was amazing that year. And uh, I got a call to a church in uh, Nottingham, back where I graduated my undergraduate degree, um, and uh, signed up also to do a doctorate at Nottingham University. So you've uh, spent a long time, as you say, a whole career really in theology. I imagine you must have changed your mind on some subjects <laughs> in that time. What have been the areas of theology where you think, wow, actually, I got that one wrong or... Uh, I've done a bit more study and, and had quite a dramatic, you know, has there been any dramatic changes in direction in your own beliefs as a result of doing this kind of work? Well, one thing I would say is that when I started off, Sam, I'm not sure I paid the theology of the church much mind. I think I was of that generation of uh, sort of young evangelicals that thought um, really it's about evangelism. It's about uh, the people of God. The church is kind of a moribund institution. We can leave that behind. But as I went on, I realized that ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, is actually vital mm. and that God loves the church. Jesus gave himself up for the church, um, as uh, Paul says in Ephesians. And um, I ended up on the Faith and Order Commission of the Church of England. Um, we haven't talked about mm -hmm. how I I was going to say, are you still, Yeah, because you're, you're presumably not still in the URC then? Uh, no, I'm not. Right. No, no. So, um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing that I've... I kind of yes. put more to the forefront of my own theological work. Yeah. The importance of the church, ecclesiology, and particularly the unity of the church and mm. the unity of Christians across different doctrinal and denominational um, and sort of networked divides. Um, uh, that's become very important to me, not as an um, end in itself, the unity of the church, but as a means to the end mm. of a more effective witness to Jesus. Mm. I was going to ask you a bit about church unity because that's a really interesting topic to get into because yeah. I think, you know, most Christians would acknowledge unity of the church is really important. But of course, how we define that yeah. can be quite different. I mean, you do a lot of work with the Evangelical Alliance yeah. Yeah. and presumably the Evangelical Alliance has a certain criteria of this is our basis for unity. And actually, there are some core beliefs we have to agree on here, which would mean that we couldn't actually work with a, a church or a Christian of who would come outside of that boundary. And yeah. the difficulty is, of course, I think every Christian draws that line in a different place. So you'd have Protestant Christians who very ha happily work with Catholics. Mm. You'd have other Protestant Christians who would have massive issues with doing that. So how have you figured that out with where you draw the line on what counts when it comes to church unity and who you can and can't work with? There was a big rift actually in the evangelical world. You might uh, be aware of it. Uh, the movement called post-evangelicalism led by Dave Tomlinson was becoming very popular and centered around the Greenbelt Arts Festival, uh, which I'd gone to actually um, around the time I was converted and been helped by. But uh, Greenbelt and David moved into a more consciously kind of post-evangelical space, embracing some of the um, philosophy uh, that was associated with postmodernism and, and the like. Um, and I wrote a book which was saying that it's important to engage with postmodern culture um, because that's uh, an undeniable phenomenon. But some of the ideology of postmodernism or ideologies of postmodernism are problematic. So I wrote a critical but um, I hope imaginative book about how evangelicals can, could engage with contemporary culture at that point and uh, entered into some quite lively debates uh, at that time. And this was prior to my working for the Evangelical Alliance being asked to do that. But it was kind of a bit of a driver for saying yes when the EA asked me to um, develop a theological commission that had been embryonic, but also to start publishing reports and books, which I did over the next decade, worked for the Alliance from 97 onwards through to the mid 2000s and absolutely adored it. I loved that combination of um, serving a very practical organisation focused on church growth, focused on engagement in the public square, focused on evangelism. Uh, but doing so with scholarly integrity. And we published a number of books with Paternoster Press, which uh, I'm still very, you know, very proud of. Mm. Um, certainly some of them, I think, um, did help some quite uh, difficult 
uh, issues mm. to be negotiated. I'll give you an example. Um, when I joined the alliance in 1997, the Toronto blessing, a big controversy about particular use of charismatic gifts, uh, was raging. And we wrote a very thoroughly scholarly study of that, which mm. still gets referenced in uh, the literature today. Another big dispute was on um, the nature of hell, mm. so-called annihilationism, whether people are eternally destroyed yep. or eternally consciously punished um, after judgment, uh, those who are unredeemed. And John Stott had come out sympathetic to uh, annihilationism. And we wrote a book called The Nature of Hell, on which I was lead writer, which I think did produce a a well-grounded argument for accepting annihilationists um, if they were authentic evangelicals in other respects as part of the family, but still having some questions to answer, if you like. What has surprised you in your time working? I was thinking particularly, we'll go on to talk about theological colleges. I mean, yeah. at St. John's Nottingham, you were there now at Moorlands. Yeah. Um, what have been the things that have surprised you that people may not be aware of or what it's like to work for a theological college? Well, uh, there's a big part of my formation as a theological educator, which predates St. John's, which is that um, in 2002, Mia and I both sensed God calling us to move from the United Reformed Church to the Church of England. And uh, we did that. And curiously, I uh, continued to work for the Evangelical Alliance, but was told by Pete Broadbent, the Bishop of Wilson, who was fantastic at kind of bringing us into the C of E fold, that I needed to do a curacy, which was a bit odd because I'd done 13 years leading <laughs> URC churches. But, um, you know, humility is important. And I said, OK, and uh, served as a curate for four years in Acton, West London, learned a lot about the just the practicalities of being a Church of England minister. Yeah. Um, and um, at the end of that, I was asked to be the director of studies at a thing called the North Thames Ministerial Training Course, which was a part-time programme of training for people going into licensed ministry in the Church of England, either as uh, clergy or, or readers. And um, and that became the genesis, that, that part-time course uh, of what then developed into St. Melitus College, right. which is now the biggest, biggest college in terms yeah. of ordinance in the whole of the Church of England. Um, I was there right at the beginning of that, actually pre the beginning of it. Um, uh, and then really shortly after I became principal, the Bishop of London, then Richard Charteris, uh, said, would you sit down with a guy called Graham Tomlin, who has recently been called to lead the School of Theology at Holy Trinity Brompton? Would you talk about how you might be able to work together because they have a lot of energy and a lot of young people. You have people of a slightly older demographic, to be fair, mm -hmm. but you have university validation and accreditation to train clergy yep. in the Church of England and readers. And I knew Graham um, a He's little. A previous guest on this show. We yeah. had him in. Yeah, yeah. now Bishop of Kensington. Yep. But I knew Graham uh, reasonably well. We had lunch together. And it was clear that we saw eye to eye on what was needed. And um, um, within about... A year, we had a new board, a new institution, new legal governance documents, and St. Melitus was born. And I was there for the first six years of St. Melitus College, which was a massive privilege. Phenomenally busy, really rewarding work, because you see the end product, and these people who are on fire for God came through. Um, but in 2012, um, uh, somewhat to my surprise, God called me to a well-established theological college in the C of E, 150 years old, called St. John's Nottingham. Mm -hmm. So that was my, in a sense, that was my third time in Nottingham when God right, called me yes. to that. So so what was it that made you move from the URC to the Church of England? Because it sounds like you yeah. were kind of being set up for a lifetime ministry in the URC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, sort of. Um, it's a complex set of reasons. I suppose I could boil it down to... Uh, theology, because um, most things get boiled down to theology with me, because <laughs> I don't think it's off in a corner. I think theology is, you know, the stuff of being a Christian. You know, um, somebody who prays and one degree is a theologian, because um, they're communicating with God and theology is about the words we say about God and more particularly God's word to us. Um, but the URC really had decided to move in a a pretty consciously liberal direction. Uh, by that point, I'd certainly understood that that's not where I was coming from mm -hmm. theologically. I valued the reform tradition, and I, I certainly had a very good uh, academic theological education, which I'll always be grateful for as a result of the URC's commitment to that. Um, 
But I suppose it was just mixing with extraordinary people across the streams in my work with the Evangelical Alliance that convinced me that um, particularly within the Church of England community of evangelicals, which was growing in confidence, which had been really cowed in the sort of 50s and 60s, but in the 70s and 80s began to come into its own and was really doing some exciting stuff, that there was a, a home there for me that was more amenable, that was easier to operate with, and to be completely blunt, that had more opportunities for me to be a theological educator than the United Reformed mm -hmm. Church. Um, and particularly thanks to, again, I name him, the Pete Broadbent, the Bishop of Wilsdon, um, his call upon me to consider coming into the Church of England was to consider being a theological educator in the C of E. And to his credit, you know, when I finished my curacy, uh, a job did come up and um, and it morphed into this extraordinary story of St. Melitus. Do you think um, the evangelical contingent in the Church of England is still as strong as, I guess, you were led to believe yeah. uh, when you kind of came in? So um, it is numerically or perhaps numerically is the wrong word, proportionally, mm. because we all know that the overall picture in the C of E is still one of decline, regrettably, um, uh, numerically. But in terms of, if you like, the slice of the cake that you could mark out or the pie chart you could mark out as evangelical, I think it's probably higher than it's ever been. Um, the big question, however, is because the Church of England is a national church, and feels this obligation to listen to the nation, listen to culture, listen to the public square, listen to where things are going to politically. The big challenge for evangelicals is, are you going to be authentically evangelical or are you going to allow culture to determine the theology that you espouse? And um, I think the next five to ten years are going to be decisive for well, evangelicals in the Church of England. We've already seen, though plenty of evangelicals some very prominent church leaders in the c of e mm. say sorry it's gone too liberal already yeah i'm out of here yeah why have you stuck around well because god's told me to um or rather god hasn't told me not to um and i want to be faithful to him um i don't think any church is perfect um i think that uh, it's important to understand that there is christ in people who are not Anglican, not Presbyterian, whatever tradition you are, for me and the Evangelical Alliance experience has a lot to do with this. Um, the gospel can be manifest in a whole range of people from a whole range of backgrounds. And um, in so far as the unity is around the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ, I think we need to be committed to that. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hales and you join me for The Profile this afternoon on Premier Christian Radio. My guest today is the Reverend Dr. David Hilborn, Principal of Moorlands College. You'll be hearing lots more from David right after this. Premier Christianity magazine. In this month's issue, we speak to lesbian and gay Christians about their experiences of faith as we uncover a conspiracy of silence in churches around the issue of sexuality. Plus, discover how God provided for five people in their hour of need. And meet the bishop who smashed the stained glass ceiling. All this and more in June's issue. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile this afternoon here on Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hales, editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the UK's leading Christian magazine. Get yourself a free sample copy of our latest issue from our website. That's premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Time now to rejoin my interview with the principal of Moreland's College, Reverend Dr. David Hilborn. Let's listen in. I noticed when you were at St. John's, I think you had to make quite a difficult decision to stop full-time courses. Yeah. I understand there were some yeah. financial pressures. And I'd love to know, is that happening across the board? You, is that a pressure that you face at, at Moorlands as well? Um, yeah. Financial pressures hitting theological colleges really across the country? So you're right. Um, I went from this flourishing, growing startup, yeah. to use that analogy, St. Melitus, St. Melitus yeah. um, to a historic residential college. Mm. St. Melitus was never residential, no. didn't have those overheads. At the time I took on St. John's, there were massive pensions deficits, a real challenge there. And also just the fact that 
residential training was underfunded by the central church. So each college doing that, um, investing in that, had to find revenue from other sources. I won't go into all the details, but one of the things we had to do was recognise the strengths of St John's in part-time training, distance learning, which had been there since the 70s, really, um, and mixed mode training as well and accentuate those and recognize that for a peculiar local reasons that was the direction we had to take it wasn't easy um, but you learn something about god's providence in that that you know through the tough times and the mountaintop experiences through growth and uh, pruning back god is still god jesus is still risen the holy spirit is still the source of life so um you know that was that was a good formational experience and then as uh, God was uh, convicting me that it was time to consider moving on extraordinarily, because I didn't assume that I would be a principal again necessarily. I thought maybe this was the opportunity to become a full on unequivocal academic, <laughs> you know, with, without all that managerial stuff that goes with being a principal. Morlands asked me. I prayed about it. Um, yeah. Mia prayed about it. And I started there in January of this year. And it's been a phenomenal privilege. They are a wonderful community, not Anglican in formation, actually start, starting with Brethren founders back in 1948. Um, we're celebrating our 70th academic year in existence this year, which is wonderful. Um, but Moreland's broadened out, um, became accredited for degree awarding um, uh, programs or became accredited for degree programs. Uh, we teach up to MA now. Um, we do foundation years, we do all sorts of uh, sort of evening classes and all sorts of training with partner organisations. We have about 580 students. Um, it's a buzzing place. My predecessor, Steve Brady, have to give him credit. For, yeah, he was there 20 years, uh, wasn't he? 19 years principal, right. yeah, uh, but he had an involvement on the board before that, so he knew Morelands well. And through that period, um, Morelands became very very well run and financially had remained stable but in the sector to answer your question there's a lot of volatility and a lot of predictions that uh, the number of theological colleges uh, in the UK and beyond uh, internationally uh, is going to reduce a countervailing trend though is that churches like Holy Trinity Brompton with the resources to shake up training to make training relevant to the coal face of ministry are either doing their own training, um, but on a better model for me, partnering with historic organisations like Moreland's to keep training relevant. And that's what we are about at Moreland's. We work with local churches and with churches further afield because we have centres in Birmingham and Torquay, as well as in Dorset, near Christchurch where our main campus is and our model is one that bears out our vision which is to equip people passionate about Jesus Christ to impact the church and the world. Are you saying though financially you, you're going to need some of these bigger churches to sort of step up and what help fund students is, is that is, is that well, what you're saying? Well the, the model at Moorlands is a bit different from denominational colleges in that we're interdenominational and proudly sure. so and most of the students who come to us are in receipt of uh, loans government loans right. um, which are now available both for BA and MA. Right. Um, uh, some of them are supported by local churches because if you've already got a degree in physics and you want to study theology mm. you can't get the loan support that you can if you're doing a first degree. But the really encouraging thing about Mornings is it's got a lot of folk who choose, as you were saying earlier, to come in at 18 and do their first degree with us right? because they want that formational environment. There's two schools of thought, isn't there, when it comes to studying. Uh, one school of thought says, go away, get some mm. real life experience first yeah. and then come and yeah. get your theological education mm. later on. You'll be older and wiser. Yeah. And there's another school of thought that says the younger, the better in one yeah. sense. We want to shape you from an early age with leadership. I understand you have, a, you have a view kind of either way on that one. And obviously it can change depending on who the person is. I'm sure, yeah. you know, God calls us all at different times. But, but would you say you err in one direction or the other when it comes to that particular debate? No, not particularly. I think it depends on the person. So I was a bit of an outlier going in to train for ordained ministry at 21 in 1985. Uh, that was very unusual. The mantra then was go away, uh, train somewhere else, get secular experience, come back at 30. Yeah. Um, uh, the journey the Church of England has been on is from that 
approach yeah. to one in which it wants to get people young. Well, I know because you, you've spoken before about you think that's a much better way of doing it. I, well, I, I think that it's important that where we're at at the moment is that the average age of a worshipper, at least in the Church of England, is my age, 55, okay? In most dioceses, is around 55. Mm. Well, that's a bit problematic, really. Mm. You want it to be a little bit earlier than that or quite considerably earlier, your average age, yeah. um, despite an aging population. So I think um, a lot of denominations right now are in the process of rebalancing their right. old ethos, which is go away, get some experience, come back in mm. your late 20s, early 30s and train for particularly ordained ministry, but other sorts of ministry too. There's a curious tradition uh, among American presidents that when they leave office, I yeah. think they leave a note, they leave a letter, yeah. um, basically giving the next president some advice. Yeah. Did, uh, did Steve Brady do that for you? He as did. You, as you came in, what was his advice to you on how to do the job that he was leaving? I think it was to make sure that you look after yourself, watch your life and doctrine closely, as Paul says to Timothy, um, to keep those things in holy balance and that's probably the most important lesson i've learned um i've been privileged to lead three theological institutions all very different as i go on i get more challenged about my own discipleship mm. simple christian following of jesus as the ground of all that i might do in strategic planning in financial management in people management at an organization that employs 50 plus people and has yeah. you know almost 600 students what, what would be your case though um even to defend the point of a theological college because yeah. there'll be some people who think well i read the bible early church you know they just sort of went out there and got on with it they started preaching the gospel baptizing yeah. people saw people saved they didn't go away to college for three years they didn't have any great theological education some of the people jesus chose didn't mm. seem to be that intelligent so there will be some who just sort of mm. think hang on what's the point in all of this what's your defense of studying theology at a theolo theological college well i firstly want to say that all theology begins for me with jesus christ and uh, we know we know that jesus was studying the scriptures intensively from boyhood because at the age of 12 in Luke's gospel he's shown debating teachers of the law um, now he was the word of God made flesh so one would assume he had a pretty good head start on understanding <laughs> what we today call the Old Testament or the Hebrew yeah. scriptures um, but there's a modeling there in that little glimpse when he's still um, in you know the, the youth of his life uh, of him intensively studying scripture and there is absolutely no question that however much he taught on the hoof he taught from the scriptures and wherever they were in their understanding of the scriptures when they began with him the disciples boy did they have to know their scriptures because Jesus um, moved fast and he ranged right over the whole gamut of the Old Testament as we call it um, and they were expected to keep up because when he went back to the father no question it was on them the apostolic ministry that he passed on was their responsibility did they dial down scriptural content did they dial down theology not if you read uh, some of the work that they contributed to the New Testament, certainly not. Paul, massively academic, massively steeped in and schooled in um, uh, the study of Scripture, uh, rabbinical study of Scripture. Does that have any relevance to what he writes in his epistles? Of course, it has massive relevance. Um, so you can study theology intensively um, in what some people call now a sort of front-loaded way by going away and you know burying yourself in the library and lectures and so forth uh, you can integrate that intensive study with placement-based learning which is our model at Moorlands all our students through the whole of their training are on some kind of placement with the local church and they even um, the students at, at Christchurch uh, do what's called a block placement for five weeks in the middle of the academic year no lectures no seminars they're just completely mm -hmm. the cold face I don't know of any other theological college that does that, but it's a mark of our commitment to practical yeah. coalface mission and ministry. But but it's married together with the uh, fullest uh, learning of the Bible and the Christian tradition and ethics mm. and all the rest that goes with a theology degree yeah. that we can manage. By nature of the job I do, sadly, I'm often having to report on or talk about Christian leaders who have fallen from grace. Yeah. I know that can be an unhelpful term, fallen from grace, but you know what I mean yeah, yeah. by that. Christian yeah. leaders who've publicly, it's emerged, they've committed some major sin yeah. or they've done something that might disqualify them mm. in some way from whatever form of Christian ministry or church leadership they do. And my question would be, 
how does that reality because it is a reality both in the uk and us we do hear these stories uh far too often i think we can all agree how does that reality play into teaching the next generation of christian leaders to warn them really yeah and to guide them and to help them to make sure that isn't their story in the future I think one of the things that we try to do very, very intentionally at Moorlands is to face up to facts, face up to the reality of being a representative of Christ in a culture in Britain, um, which is increasingly lacking in biblical literacy or empathy for gospel Christianity. Um, And that requires levels of resilience and of fortitude that perhaps um, previous generations of Christians didn't need to have in quite the same way. Um, So we, from day one, equip people to have lifelong ministries. I think we need to get real about the fact that there are dips in Christian life. I talked about my sort of crisis of of understanding of what God wanted me to do. Um, I didn't lose my faith or anything, but when I was at Oxford, I I had to take time out um, for a week or so in the middle of my studies just to recalibrate everything. Um, And, you know, I've had ups and downs in my public uh, ministry, which now is well over 30 years um, since being ordained. Um, And you learn from the dips as Mm. much as you do from the successes. I mean, St. Melitus was the massive success story, really, of theological education of the last, I'd say, 20 years in Britain. Um, And I was part of it. I was there at the very beginning. It was exhilarating. Um, But. I've learned as much mm. from working in institutions that haven't been soaring successes. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important, the resilience that Christ calls us to, to instill that in students. Um, and uh, one of my um, core texts for my time at Moorlands, I, I preached on this in my first sermon, is 2 Peter 1.8, which is, talks about being effective and fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it talks about that in the face of all the the setbacks and the challenges that you're liable to encounter in a world that doesn't always take the gospel to heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. So growing secularism is a massive, massive topic. Mm. Um, but it's so, as you say, so relevant for this next generation. This next generation of students live in a completely different world to yeah. the previous generation or two. Like you say, knowledge of the Bible is nowhere near what it once was. It, previously, perhaps when Christians were thinking about evangelism, Mm. they might be able to assume some low-level knowledge of a few Bible stories. Um, Back in Billy Graham's day, of course, he based his ministry on that famous quote, the Bible says, and there was a level of respect, perhaps, even amongst those who weren't Christians for what the Bible says. Nowadays, very, very different position, uh, far more sceptical culture. Mm. What do we do about that? And are you optimistic about the future of the church in this country? Because a lot of the statistics would suggest that we shouldn't be optimistic. Well, the first thing I want to say is you don't give up on the authority of the word of God. I believe that is the supreme authority for Christian faith and conduct. But we have to find new ways to put that over. So I'll just give you one example. Um, At Moreland's uh, a few weeks ago, we did something called A Word in a Week, which was a celebration of a new partnership we forged with Wycliffe Bible Translators. They're joining with us at our Dorset campus to run a new MA in language, community and development, equipping the next generation of Bible translators to do that work, but also instilling that sense of making the Bible relevant for a world that doesn't always even understand the basics of Scripture. Mm. Um, So what we did in celebration of that new partnership with Wycliffe was to read the whole of the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation in the course of a week. We started at eight in the morning, went through to 10 p.m. at night. It lasted six days. We rested on the (laughs) seventh day, which is in itself a, a good biblical thing to do. And um, it was phenomenal. I mean, I, I just got so fired up. I did more reading than originally scheduled. Um, for example, just read the whole of Two Kings, all 25 chapters in one sitting, wow. which was So was just this immense. individuals would just do this yeah. privately? Or? So members of the community, um, students, trustees, staff, and alumni all over the world right. sent us recordings of them reading hmm. an allocated portion of scripture, okay. which we then edited all together. Some of it was live, some of it was pre-recorded, yeah. Yeah. but the whole of the Bible in sequence was read through that whole week. And it was then live streamed on Facebook yeah. and uh, available on our website. Um, and lots of people tuned in, thousands of people just mm. to see this in operation. We had sign language, we had um, wow. people reading scripture in texts of the Bible that had only just been produced 
in the previous few months by Wycliffe Bible Translators. So they weren't reading from a book. They were reading from typescripts that were waiting to be published as books um, or Bible, you know, yeah. uh, books. And, um, oh, it was it was a wonderful, relevant and engaging way to put across mm. God's word written. Um, that's just one example of um, not yeah. giving up on the authority of Scripture, not saying, oh, well, people don't understand Scripture. Let's uh, let's tell some other stories um uh, that are vaguely nice and you know life affirming no we have to be rooted and grounded in the word of god because i believe that's authentic christianity but we need to just find new ways to to put that over mm. that idea of reading the whole bible together uh, yeah. reminds me of something francis chan said and he was a previous guest on this show and, yeah. and he pointed out how the end of revelation it actually promises a blessing to those who read aloud the words of this yes. book and yeah. francis chan says you know how many churches do you know that will stand up and will read out loud the whole yeah. of revelation because we think oh that's a really scary part of the bible we don't really understand it or we need to interpret it properly and it was a really challenging remark to say okay for all the clever sermon illustrations and for all the great mm. sermons you've heard how many times have we as christians sat down and together just read the word of God. Do we really believe yeah. this is the word of God? Yeah, um, uh, Paul says to Timothy, um, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. Yeah. Um, faith comes by hearing, Paul also says. But the public uh, reading of scripture, and I come back to vast majority of churches, what will happen is you might get a few verses, maybe yeah. half the chapter, maybe yeah. a whole chapter read, and then you'll get a sermon uh, so most of the time yeah. is not public reading of scripture. Most of the time is actually someone else interpreting or unpacking yeah. the scriptures. Have we lost something of the importance of just actually reading the text? I think we have. Um, now, I don't want in any way to uh, be partisan about this. Um, I think it was always good that the standard sort of Church of England service will have a psalm. It will have at least one reading, possibly two or even three from Scripture, you know, Old Testament um, epistle and gospel, as well as a psalm. Um, now, what you do with that in a sermon is another thing. Um, other traditions will read just a few verses, but if they're really doing the stuff, they'll expound those verses mm. really thoroughly. There are different ways to do it. But um, I do get frustrated sometimes when, you know, a passage of scripture is read, sometimes not very long, and the sermon seems to be on something completely other, just a thematic uh, set of thoughts that don't relate to the text of scripture. So if I have a core value about preaching, it's follow the contours of scripture. So um, really close exegetical expository preaching is appropriate verse by verse when you've got quite close concentrated doctrinal teaching but if you've got a wider narrative sweep something like esther then you might want to take longer chunks and preach on those week by week it doesn't really uh, matter but it has to be faithful to what i call the landscape or the contours mm. of scripture and i worry that a lot of our preaching and teaching these days is not it's kind of tangential to the text of scripture and my formation in the reform tradition and in the evangelical faith um, which I take really seriously, um, has made me really, really committed to uh, scriptural mm. preaching. What's been the best day of your ministry and what's been the worst day? My goodness, what a question. Gosh, I don't know if I've ever thought of my ministry quite like that. Um, I think one of the most profound days of my ministry was um, after nine years of uh, concentrated and massively enjoyable work at the Evangelical Alliance. I had a, a kind of farewell uh, party, which they were very kind to put on for me. And I said, you know, that this opportunity that you've given me to work at that interconnection of gospel Christianity, um, church unity and mission and evangelism has set me up really for the rest of my life. Having served there, at a space which was absolutely fitted to my vision and my calling. Um, I think that everything that's followed since then really in a sense has borne out that formation, uh, doing theology for the church of Jesus Christ, theology that's actionable, theology that allows others to be effective and fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Mm. Um, so that was a pivotal moment for yeah. me. And the worst day? The worst day. Um, well, there have been tough times. I can remember very early on as a URC minister in my first church, Keyworth in Nottingham, sitting with a family whose 21-year-old son who had a glittering career ahead of him, doing brilliantly at university, had 
quite unexpectedly um, committed suicide. Mm. Um, just sat in a car and put the exhaust um, uh, through the car and, and died. And trying to find words to say to them, when I had all that book learning at Oxford and um, was uh, actually uh, in my, I think, second year of my PhD, so I had all the intellectual um, theological yeah. journeying but yeah. trying to find appropriate words at that moment that was a tough day sure yeah there, i guess i've heard other christian leaders say before there almost isn't there almost aren't any appropriate words in a sense i mean it's yeah is it literally just a question of being there of mm. saying i'm sorry mm. um i think especially on the question of suffering because I, i've heard those who are who really know their stuff on apologetics say mm. this quite a lot say when someone asks you a question like why does a good god allow suffering mm. you have to be careful and check are you asking that question because you've gone through immense yes. pain yourself yeah. this is a personal question or is this just like you say a more mm. theoretical question because for a lot of people that question is very personal isn't it yeah i'm very influenced by the reformation um i would want to say that um, evangelicalism, the tradition I identify with and of course publicly have represented as a theologian for so long um, it is a Protestant tradition historically, that's just a historic mm. fact um, but um, has taken on board other expressions of the good right. news of Jesus yeah. Christ along the way, so Pentecostalism which I'm mm. fascinated by, a member of the Society for Pentecostal Studies working very hard on bringing Anglicans and Pentecostals close together, that's a big commitment that I have um, but Pentecostalism, you know, coming later into the story, um, has adopted some elements of the Protestant origins of, of evangelicalism and has some distinctive things itself. But um, for me, the core of that uh, Protestant understanding of the faith goes to Luther's distinction between um, the theology of the cross and the theology of glory. And for Luther, if your theology leapfrogs Good Friday, and fast forwards to Easter Day without the agony, without the um, devastation of the cross, without the darkness that descended across the earth when Jesus died uh, on the cross, then it's not a truly biblical, a truly Christian theology. So for me, one of the litmus tests of authentic theology is, do I see the cross as well as the resurrection, the ascension and the glorification of Christ in this theology? Mm. Um, one of the projects that I worked on at the Alliance was on the so-called prosperity gospel. Now, it's nuanced, it's complex. I don't want to boil it down to sort of simplistic statements. But some elements of so-called prosperity teaching, I believe, fall down because they fast forward to Easter Day and glorification and they don't have Luther's stress mm. on the theology of the cross. Yeah. We've covered lots of big issues, and we're um, sadly nearly out of time. But mm. I did notice that you recently, I think, took part in a dialogue or possibly even a sermon on Brexit and what the yeah. Christian response is to Brexit. Yeah. And I thought, I can't let you go without <laughs> asking you that question. This is one of the huge issues of our time. We yeah. know that, I think we can probably both agree, that good Christians voted both ways on this. Yes, some Christians did, yeah. voted remain, some yeah. voted to leave. Yeah. Um, I imagine a lot of people just sort of standing back and saying, well... God probably doesn't have an opinion. Vote for whatever you thought was best. Mm. Um, oh, yes, isn't it sad? The country seems like a bit of a mess, whatever way you voted. But yeah. is there really any, anything more to say than that would be what a lot of people are wondering. Well, I think it's important to frame what I did uh, in the context of its being a dialogue with a fellow evangelical, John Risbridger, the um, minister of Above Bar Church in Southampton, which is now a local church mm. to Moorlands and has a really uh, dynamic relationship with Moorlands College. And uh, John chairs the board of the Evangelical Alliance, um, uh, sorry, the Council of the Evangelical Alliance, and um, is um, a really good theological thinker in his own right. And we were asked to uh, advise the Council of the Alliance on Brexit, um, not to tell them to vote leave <laughs> or vote remain or support leave. I imagine that wouldn't have gone remain. down so well if you no, tried to do that. No, because <laughs> all the evidence is that the evangelical community is as yes. uh, split on this as the yeah. country as a whole. Yeah. So it would have been an amazingly uh, presumptuous of us to tell people how to vote. Um, what we tried to do was explore some of the underlying theological principles that should inform the way that we try to work together, leavers and remainers, uh, as we go forward, whatever the outcome, whether it's second referendum, no deal or revoking Article 50. Um, and they were around an understanding of what the nation state is in Scripture, okay. um, how it sits with respect to God's kingdom 
namely that the realm or kingdom or reign of God is always, um, always authoritative over any expression of the nation state. Mm. No nation state should ever become an idol. Mm. And when the nation state becomes an idol in scripture, Israel is guilty of that or it's guilty of making alliances with nation states who set themselves up as idols, then disaster tends to follow. Um, and therefore, a chauvinistic understanding of one's own nation, which trumps one's commitment to God, is problematic. Mm. Um, however, by the same token, not least in the evangelical tradition, the principle of self-determination, the principle of freedom, particularly religious freedom, the ability to preach the gospel, the ability to have a a nation state which is supportive of different voices, different expressions of Christianity and indeed of, of religious faith is critically important. Mm. And um, I would say that, you know, um, where arguments about sovereignty are not leading to idolatry of the nation state, but more to the way in which a single nation regulates its own affairs with respect mm. to freedom and liberty, then there's an important principle at stake uh, however Brexit turns yeah. out, which is that Britain has to have a sense of itself as a nation that supports the Christian faith, but also other expressions of religious uh, religious faith as well. Because if we want to preach the gospel, if we want to minister to Christ in a free country, we have to first and foremost um, see our own government as in a sense, proprietors of that, as holding that responsibility. Um, they're under God, Romans 13. They, they are appointed by God. And uh, we, have to, we have to make sure that we hold them to account. Yes. Now, there's a question about the difference between holding your own nation state's government to account and holding mm -hmm. the commission or the council or the parliament well, of a continent-wide <laughs> um, institution that's made up of 20 plus states well, and, and how that works out is is is, yeah. is, is at the core of the, core what of the of, issue. What of the view that I've heard from some evangelicals yeah. that is, is saying that actually this institution, the EU, is yeah. ungodly, yeah. it even has parallels with Babylon, yeah. I've used some very prophetic language to say yeah. this is something we have to completely resist. I mean, from your point, point of view, just as a theologian, yeah. Do you think that argument that's very strongly Brexit and people would actually point to various Bible verses? Yeah, they would. In yeah. that sense, do you, do you think that argument? Do you have any sympathy with with that? Well, I mean, I'm I'm influenced. I'm I'm not um, a Bartian, but I'm influenced by Karl Barth, as a lot of evangelicals are. I don't buy into all his uh, theological positions, but I think he's had a a major impact on theology in the last century. Um, and he uh, famously compared Romans 13, which is you might say a conservative take on the church's relation to government. Government has been given the authority to sort of wield the sword, to yep. um, expect um, its citizens to obey the law and so forth. He contrasted Romans 13 with Revelation 13, where you've got the beasts from the sea and the earth, and um, they represent effectively all the worst that Rome can throw at right. the church. All the worst of, of government, I guess. Era, yeah. Nero, perhaps. Um, and, um, of course, he was writing against the background of fascism, mm. of Nazism. And so there are instances where imperial projects like the Third Reich can begin to manifest the Antichrist. But here's the thing about the EU. Whatever you think about its current arrangements, the vision that set the EU up was actually to bring Europe together after the Nazis had fragmented it. So I am I have some sympathy historically mm. with people like, say, Michael Hestein, who argue, um, Dennis Healy used to argue this, who'd fought in the Second World War or, or who'd lived in the shadow of the Second World War, that the uh, European Union, as originally envisaged, was a project for peace and reconciliation. Now, whether it still maintains that as its main principle or whether it's become some kind of overblown, marketized capitalist empire, mm. which isn't necessarily a particularly Christian entity, I think that's up for mm. debate. Um, I don't certainly think that the EU is perfect by any means, and I think it does need to be questioned and critiqued. Um, if we're going to leave and the vote was, of course, that we should, marginally, that we should leave, then my plea as a Christian theologian is that that should in no way, shape or form 
intensify or worsen um, uh, the relational bonds that so many Christians have in this country with Christians on the European continent. Um, A really great friend of mine, uh, John Woods, pastor of Lansing Tabernacle um, on the south coast in Sussex, uh, who I pray with and who I reflect theologically with. He's currently in Latvia uh, working with the church there to um, improve theological education and the infrastructure of mission there. Um, I don't want to see links like that Mm. in any way made worse by Brexit. They don't have to be. They don't have to be in any way, shape or form. But I think the debates become so toxic that Christians have to beware that they don't start becoming unduly xenophobic um, or, you know, kind of unduly suspicious of Europeans. As has been said before by some, I think, you know, we we voted to leave an institution, not to leave a continent. Yes, exactly. Um, 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 Any Brexiteer worth their salt with any integrity, mm. of course, would say that. Mm. But it's one thing to say it and another thing to do it and model it. And I think Christians can lead the way um, if Brexit does happen in one way or another. Mm. They can lead the way in showing Mm. that um, just because we've left a political uh, and financial union doesn't mean that we can't be one in Christ even more intensively with our Mm. French and German and Bulgarian brothers and sisters in the Lord. So when you're not thinking about theology and Brexit, what do you do to relax? Well, my passion really, um, one of them anyway, is sport, um, particularly cricket. I played a lot of Ah. cricket as a young man. and um, At the time of recording, of course. Yes, uh, well, it's the ICC World Cup. We are hosting, I understand. Yeah, we are hosting. someone who doesn't follow sport or cricket, I understand this is quite important. Uh, This is major, (laughs) Sam. Yeah, get with the programme, man. Yeah, so uh, it's um, as much as I can do... Would you like to speak prophetically now about who's (laughs) going to win? (laughs) Oh, well, I mean, England have the best chance they've had for many a year. Yeah, Yeah, we've got the best best one-day side, 50-over side that we've had for a long, long time. But that doesn't mean we're going to win it. Um, (laughs) uh, When it gets to the knockout stage, um, and they've got to play nine games before they get there, but when it gets to the knockout stage, who knows? Cricket is... uh, The great thing about cricket, actually, I can tell you this, um, is that you can have a fantastic match one week, you know, score 100, and the next week you can get out for a golden duck, you know, and sit most of the time in the pavilion while your mates are batting. And if you follow cricket, you'll know what a golden duck is, I'm sure. Yeah, well, it's when you're out first ball. So you go out, you put all your pads on, get all your gear on, which is a lot for cricket. Um, and uh, you hope you're going to be there for two hours or so. And uh, you get uh, the middle stump knocked out of the ground and you're walking back to the pavilion and that's your day over. Unless you're a very committed fielder or you can bowl as well, in which case you can uh, get some compensation. But actually, you know, over the years, um, I found that to be instructive and um, I've talked to a few men's groups in particular although it could could be mixed groups as well about how cricket kind of has some resonance theologically because um, it teaches you about relying on others in a team in community cricket is intensely individual when it's you against a bowler you know it really is up to you to defend or attack or whatever score runs but you've got a mate at the other end that you've got to complete a run with and you've got nine others back in the pavilion who you know you're going to have to build an innings with and when you're fielding you absolutely have to work as a unit um and it really depends on all of you being on point um there's lots more i could say well i asked you about what you do to relax and switch off from theology and you've wonderfully brought cricket back to make a theological point you know i live a holistic (laughs) life sam so even when i'm relaxing i'm i'm seeing the theological links i also love reading poetry um my whole family we we love going to the hay literary festival because we're all readers and i think it's important for christians not only to read christian books Mm -hmm. um actually my first degree was in english and linguistics yeah and i still absolutely love reading Mm -hmm. um literature of other types um i think that keeps my my mind fresh and music as well I'm, i'm a massive rock music fan my music collection is ridiculously large (laughs) well david it's been a pleasure to uh talk and to hear about all things theology cricket and more so thank you so much for coming in sam great to talk thank you you're listening to premier christian radio i'm sam hales and that was my interview with the reverend dr david hilborn principal of moorlands college
We'll be back same time, same place next week with another great interview for you. Until then, don't forget you can request a free sample copy of the magazine that I edit. It's Premier Christianity, the UK's leading Christian magazine. Just go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample, type your address in, and we will happily send you a free copy of the latest print edition. No strings attached, no obligation to subscribe. Simply fill out your details and we'll send you a free copy premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.